In this lecture, we're going to start looking at rotational motion. So this is actually much easier to learn if we think about the similarities between rotational motion and the translational motion that we've already learned about. So in this lecture, we're going to look at rotational motion compared with translational motion, and we'll also have a look at moments of inertia. So the textbook reference for this lecture, you can look in sections 10.1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of the Halliday, Resnick, and Walker textbook. So first of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas from the last lecture. In the last lecture, we were looking at collisions, and we saw that in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. We also considered inelastic collisions, where some of the kinetic energy is lost. And we considered perfectly or completely inelastic collisions, where the two colliding bodies stuck together and so they had the same final velocity and we looked at the equations as applied to each of these cases in all of these cases momentum was conserved we then had a look at a rocket which is another example of a collision but what's different here is that there's a changing mass with time so we saw that we could write for the rocket that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the rate of mass lost times the relative velocity of the fuel with respect to the rocket and we also saw that the final velocity minus the initial velocity is equal to the relative velocity of the fuel with respect to the rocket times the logarithm of the initial mass divided by the final mass. Okay, so we'll start by presenting a nice table which shows all the rotational variables and the translational ones so that we can draw these analogies. So we can see we've got displacement with the symbol S for the translational case, or sometimes D or X, and in the rotational case, the symbol's theta, and it's the angular displacement. We've got velocities and angular velocities. We have seen the symbol omega before when we were looking at circular motion. We've got an acceleration and an angular acceleration, which is the Greek letter alpha. We've got a force and we've got a torque, which is a kind of turning force. We've got mass, and then we've got a moment of inertia, which has the symbol capital letter I, and we'll be looking at how to calculate this later. We've also got momentum and an angular momentum. So let's look at this in a little more detail now. We're now going to consider rotational motion. Now, rotational motion, like this, can be a little bit overwhelming because of all the new symbols that are introduced. However, the basic physics underlying it is pretty much the same. So in this video, we're going to look at the analogy between the translational quantities, so that's the movement quantities that you've already seen, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, those kind, types of things, and the rotational case. And then when we look at rotation in more detail, you'll be able to see how really we're just reproducing pretty much the same equations with the analogous symbol in place. Okay, so first of all, in the translational case, when something moves through space, it has a displacement. In the rotational case, when we have something moving through an angle like this, it has an angular displacement. So we typically use the symbol theta to represent the angular position of the object, and then we can use delta theta to show the change in angle as the object moves. So if this is the initial angle and this is the final angle, then delta theta is just theta f minus theta i, the final angle minus the initial angle. Just as in displacement, we have that the change in displacement is equal to the final displacement minus the initial displacement, and we typically use S or X to represent our displacement. Now, when something is translating, it has a speed which, or a velocity, which we represent by the letter V, which tells us how quickly the displacement is changing. So we have the equation V is equal to dx dt, if we're just considering one dimension in the x direction. We have a completely analogous thing in rotation. So we have an angular speed or an angular velocity, which is given the symbol omega, and omega is equal to d theta dt. 
when something's moving through space, it can be accelerating, and acceleration is just dv dt, how quickly the velocity is changing, or we can take the second derivative of the displacement, d squared x dt squared, for example. Well, the same thing with rotation. When something's rotating, it can start rotating at a faster and faster pace. I don't think I can turn it faster and faster, but if it's speeding up with time, then it will have an angular acceleration. This is represented by the Greek letter alpha, and alpha is equal to d omega dt, which is equal to the second derivative of theta. So this is d squared theta dt squared. So completely analogous. Now, those ones are fairly straightforward and easy to see. Some of the quantities are a little bit harder to see. So, to start something moving, we need to apply a force to it. That's what Newton's first law tells us. An object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, if we want to get something turning, we need to apply a turning force to it, which is what's known as a torque. So torque is given the symbol tau, and it's analogous to force. Now, Newton's laws all have analogies too. So Newton's first law tells us an object at rest will remain at rest unless stacked upon by an unbalanced force. Well, Newton's first law for rotation says an object not rotating will remain not rotating unless acted upon by an unbalanced torque. And we have the similar rules for Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Now, another not so obvious one is mass. So the amount of force will accelerate an object and the amount of the acceleration will depend upon the mass of that object. Well, in rotational motion, rather than the mass, it's the moment of inertia that is important. So the moment of inertia is given the symbol I, and we'll look at more examples of how to calculate this later, but I is equal to the integral of R squared dm. So what this is telling us for rotation is that it's not just the amount of mass that it's that is important. It's also r, which is the distance from the pivot point, which is important. So if we have a mass further from the pivot point, then it's going to have a greater moment of inertia, and we are going to have to apply more torque in order to get it to move. And finally, in the translational case, we've seen that we have momentum. We've got a similar quantity called angular momentum in the rotational case. So hopefully using these analogies as you work through this topic will show you that really this is just the same thing again, just with slightly different letters. So these analogies actually follow through to the kinematic equations as well. So for example, we've got our kinematic equation V is equal to U plus AT. Now this has a rotational analogy. We can write omega, the angular speed, is equal to omega naught, the initial angular speed, plus the angular acceleration times time. Similarly, we can write v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. In the rotational case, is omega squared is equal to omega naught squared plus 2 alpha theta, where theta is the total angle through which it's moved in radians. And finally, we've got s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, which we can again write as theta is equal to omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared. What we're going to look at now is how we can relate linear variables to angular ones. So we've seen the analogy between the two, but now we want equations which have both types of quantities in it so that we can convert from one type to another type. So when we're considering distances traveled, the way to do this is actually with the arc length of a circle. So if something's undergoing circular motion, moving in a circle, then it's tracing out a circular path. And so the distance it's traveled, s, is related to the angle it's turned through, theta, through our equation s is equal to theta r, where r is the radius of the circle, s is the distance it's traveled through, and theta is the angular displacement, so the total angle it has traveled through. Now, to relate the velocity to the angular velocity, we can just differentiate this equation. So when we differentiate 
the distance it's traveled, we get the speed. So ds dt is equal to v. And then when we differentiate the right hand side, we've got the derivative of theta r with respect to time. Now, when we're considering something undergoing circular motion, the radius which it is at is not changing. So dr dt is just zero because r is a constant. So this tells us that when we're doing the derivative of theta times r, this is the same as r times d theta dt. And we've seen that d theta dt can just be written as omega. So this gives us the equation v is equal to r omega, which we saw when we were looking at circular motion previously. Now acceleration gets a little bit more confusing because we have two different types of acceleration. So before, when we were looking at uniform circular motion, which means circular motion where it's not speeding up, it's got a constant angular speed, we saw that the acceleration was directed back towards the center of the motion. So that is a radial acceleration, which we also call the centripetal acceleration. And the centripetal acceleration, same thing as the radial acceleration, is equal to v squared on r. So any object moving around the circle at any speed has a radial acceleration directed towards the center of the circle, which is given by v squared on r. If the velocity is changing, then this centripetal acceleration will also be changing with time. Now our equation v equals omega r tells us about the speed of the object around the circle. So to make this a velocity, we need to consider its direction. The speed was in a tangent to the circle. So that is a tangential speed around the circle. So if we now consider what happens when we differentiate our equation v is equal to omega r, because that's going to give us a acceleration type quantity, that needs to have the same direction as the velocity, because differentiating it isn't going to change its direction. So we have dv dt is equal to the tangential acceleration, so directed as a tangent to our circle, which is equal to d omega r dt. And once again, r is not changing, so we can pull it out the front of our derivative. So we've got r d omega dt, and we've seen that d omega t dt is equal to alpha. So we can say, well, the tangential acceleration is equal to r alpha. Now, for the case of uniform circular motion, the omega is not changing. So alpha, the angular acceleration, is zero, so we have no tangential acceleration. So for the uniform circular motion, we only had that radial acceleration given by v squared on r. But if something's starting to go faster and faster and faster, then it does have a tangential component. So we've got two types of acceleration at right angles to each other. We've got the radial directed towards the center and the tangential, which is a tangent to the circle. If we want to find the total acceleration of an object which is rotating, then we need to add these two together, which because they're at right angles to each other, we can just do with Pythagoras' theorem. So this tells us that the magnitude of the total acceleration is just equal to the square root of the tangential acceleration squared plus the radial acceleration squared. So let's have a look at an example of a problem that we could solve using this now. The question is, the angular displacement of an object is described by theta is equal to 0 0.100 t cubed as it rotates about a pivot point 2.00 meters away. Part A, write an expression for the angular speed of the object. B, write an expression for the speed of the object. C, write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object. D, writing an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. E, what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the object? Okay, so we have that theta is equal to 0 0.100 t cubed and that the radius is equal to 2 meters. And in part A, we're right, asked to write an expression for the angular speed. So we want omega, which is equal to d theta dt. So we're differentiating our expression for theta here, which is 0 0.100 t cubed with respect to t. 
So this is just differentiating something which is cubed. So we end up with 3 times 0 0.100 t squared. So the 3 comes from the initial cube here, which we move down the front when we differentiate it. So this is equal to 0 0.300 t squared. Part B then asks us to write an expression for the speed of the object. So the speed V is equal to omega R. And we just calculated omega in part A. So omega was 0 0.300 T squared times R, which was 2 meters. So this is equal to 0 0.600 T squared as R speed. Part C then asks us to write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object. So the radial acceleration is the same thing as the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared on R. And we've just calculated V squared in part B. So that's 0 0.600 T squared or squared on R, which is 2. So solving this, we end up with 0 0.180 T to the 4. Okay, let's just scroll up to give ourselves a little bit more room to finish this off. Part D then asks us to write an expression for the tangential acceleration. Okay, so the tangential acceleration is equal to dv dt because the velocity was tangential. And so this is equal to d omega r dt, which is equal to r d omega dt, which is equal to 2 because 2 is r times d omega and omega we found in part a. So this was 0 0.300 t squared dt. So this is 2 times the 2 and that second 2 comes from here. That's that one. This one's this one. And then we times 0 0.300 times t. And so this is equal to 1.20 t. And then finally, part E asks us what's the magnitude of the acceleration of the object. So the acceleration is equal to, we've got the square root of the radial acceleration squared plus the tangential acceleration squared. And this is just using Pythagoras because the radial and the tangential are at right angles to each other. So we can just substitute in here our answers from C and D. So we've got the square root of 0 0.180 t to the 4 squared plus 1.20 t squared. So we have got the square root of 0 0.0324 t to the 8 plus 1.44 t squared. Let's pull t squared out as a common factor. And then because we're taking the square root of it, we can pull it all the way out the front as t because the square root of t squared is t. So we can put t, just scrolling up, we can put t out the front and then we've got the square root of 0 0.0324 and we've got t to the 6 left plus 1.44. So there's our expression for the magnitude of the acceleration of the object. We're now going to consider rotational inertia, which is also known as the moment of inertia, and it's written with the symbol capital I. The moment of inertia of a body relates to how hard it is to start the body spinning. So how much torque we have to apply to get it to start turning. So when you think about it intuitively, you know that if we have two masses which are quite far from a pivot point, like in this case here, it's a little harder to get it to spin than if we move the masses closer to the center. In this case, I can apply less torque, which is the turning force, in order to get it turning. So to come up with an expression for I, the moment of inertia, we're going to consider the kinetic energy of a body as it rotates. So let's just slide these back along. Let's consider this body here. We've got two masses. Let's assume to make it simple that this bar is massless and that it's rotating like this. 
Now, from what we've learnt before, we know that because this is absolutely symmetric, the centre of mass is right in the middle. So as I turn it, that centre of mass is not moving. So while this is rotating like this, it has no translational kinetic energy. But it's incorrect to say that it has absolutely no kinetic energy at all because parts of it are moving. These two masses on the end are moving. So they must have some form of kinetic energy. So the type of kinetic energy that they have is known as rotational kinetic energy. So if I want it to have translational kinetic energy, then I actually have to move it through space like this. But while it's just stationary, it has only the rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so let's look at how we can calculate the size of this kinetic energy. So let's consider just one mass here. Let's call this one mass one, and on the other end we have mass two. At the moment I'm rotating it about the center, but I don't necessarily have to. So let's call the distance from the pivot point to mass 1, R1, and the distance from the pivot point to mass 2, R2. So the pivot point is the point about which I am turning it. So when it's turned, then mass 1 here has kinetic energy given by a half mass 1 times the speed of mass 1 squared. But it's moving in a circle, so we know that V is equal to omega R. And in this case, we've got V1, and it's at radius R1. And so we can say, well, the kinetic energy of mass 1 is given by a half m omega R1 all squared. And so that's equal to a half m1 R1 squared times omega squared. Now for mass 2, it's rotating at the same rate because they're all connected to this one body which is all rotating at the same rate. So by rotating at the same rate, we mean they've got the same omega. So omega is the same for everything attached to this body. So the kinetic energy for our second mass, mass 2, is given by a half m2 r2 squared times omega squared. And so the total kinetic energy as it rotates, assuming that my bar is massless, is given by a half m1 r1 squared omega squared plus a half m2 r2 squared omega squared. So we can write this as a half times m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared times omega squared. Now if we imagined having lots of separate masses along my bar, then as I rotate it, they all rotate at the same rate, so they've all got the same omega. And we could say, well, that the total kinetic energy is equal to a half times the sum over all the masses of the mi, which is the, the mass that a particular mass has, times ri squared, the distance of that particular mass from the pivot point, or times omega squared. Now, previously we've been looking at the analogy between translational quantities and rotational quantities. So for the translational case, we know that the translational kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared. And here for the rotational case, we've got that our rotational kinetic energy is given by a half times the sum over i, mi ri squared times omega squared. And we know that the angular equivalent of the velocity is the angular velocity, omega. And so it suggests that that sum is something special and is equivalent to the mass. So that sum is in fact our moment of inertia. So we can say, well, the moment of inertia i is equal to the sum of mi ri squared summed over all the little masses involved. So that's what our moment of inertia is. Now let's at this point assume that our rod is no longer massless. If we wanted to work out the moment of inertia of this rod as we pivoted it about one end say, what we'd need to do was sum up the contribution of each of the little points along the rod. And so when we do that, we're going from a sum into an integral, because an integral is just a sum where we break it into really small components. So for continuous bodies, we can say the moment of inertia is given by the integral of r squared dm, which is equivalent to our sum over i of mi times ri squared. 
So now we've seen what the moment of inertia is, let's have a look at how to calculate it for a few different shapes. So let's start with the simple case of two masses, both mass m and each a distance r from the pivot point about which the system turns. So in this case, because we've got discrete masses rather than a continuous mass, we're assuming here that this bar is massless, we can say, well, I, the moment of inertia, is equal to the sum over lowercase i, mi, ri squared, which in this case, we've just got the two masses, both at the same radius r. So this is equal to mr squared plus mr squared, which is all equal to 2mr squared. So that is how we calculate the moment of inertia of two point masses. Now let's consider a rod. A rod is a little bit more complicated because it is a continuous mass distribution. We've got mass all the way along the rod. So we're going to make the assumption for our rod that it has a constant linear density. So the linear density is the same all the way along the rod. Now, linear density, we tend to represent in physics by the symbol lambda, and it is literally the mass of the rod. So if I weighed my ruler on the scales and got that mass, that mass divided by the length of the rod. So in this case, it's a meter ruler. So that length would be one meter. So lambda is equal to m on L. Now, later in other topics, you may also see surface density, which we usually give the symbol sigma to, and the surface density is equal to the mass divided by the surface area. Or there's the volume density, which is what you're probably used to referring to density as. The, surf the volume density is usually represented by the Greek letter rho, and it's equal to the mass over the volume. But when we're considering something where the mass is just spread out evenly in one dimension, it's easiest to use the linear density. Okay, so what we'll need to do in this case is use our formula to calculate the moment of inertia. We'll be using I is equal to the integral of R squared dm. And if this rod is pivoted about one end, we'll be breaking our meter ruler, in this case, up into little increments, each with length dl and mass dm. And then we'll be summing up those increments all along the rod to get our total moment of inertia. Okay, so we're considering a rod which is pivoted about one end like this. So in our formula for the moment of inertia, I is equal to the integral of R squared dm. R represents the distance from the pivot point. So this is our pivot axis here. So this end here is at R equals zero. And this end here is at R equals L if our rod has a length L, which we're assuming it does and we'll let the rod have a mass m. Now, what we want to do is approach this question much like we approach the center of mass problem. So what we'll do is consider a little increment of the rod here. So we'll let this little increment have a length dr and a mass dm, and it is a distance r from our pivot point. And what we want to do is work out, well, how does this little bit and we want to work out, well, how does this little bit contribute to the moment of inertia? Well, it contributes a little bit. So the little bit it contributes is di, and that is equal to its distance from the pivot point squared. So this is r squared, not dr. dr is the length of the increment, but in our moment of inertia formula here, this term is referring to the distance from the pivot point. So that's an r squared, there's no dr there. And then it's times the mass of this little increment. And we've said, well, that little increment has a mass dm. So this is how much that little increment contributes to the moment of inertia. So now if we want to work out the total moment of inertia along the rod, what we're going to need to do is sum together all of these little increments. So we will then have, well, i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. And in this case, we're summing from one end of the rod, which is at r equals zero, up to the other end of the rod, which is at r equals l. 
And now we've got this R squared DM in here, which is a bit inconvenient to deal with because we've got a DM and an R and how does R relate to DM? We'd need to know that in order to be able to solve this integral. So in order to work out how they relate, and useful quantity is the linear density. So the linear density has the symbol lambda, and this is the linear density. And it is equal to the mass divided by the length. So we've got both the mass and the length in this case. Now there's a couple of other densities that you will come across in physics. We've got a surface density, which is represented by sigma. which is equal to the mass divided by the area. And then we've got our usual density, which you've seen before, rho. This is equal to the volume density. And it is equal to the mass divided by the volume. But the one we want to use right now is lambda is equal to m on l. And how this helps is, well, that lets us come up with the amount of mass that little increment dr has. So we can write, well, the mass of something, just rearranging this formula, is equal to lambda times L. So that tells us that the mass of our little increment is equal to lambda times the length of our increment, which we've said is dr. So now we've got a relationship between dm and dr. Now, in this case, we were assuming that our rod had a uniform density, so lambda is just a constant. It is possible to get questions where lambda is varying. So if a rod is getting, say, thicker as you move along its length, then it will get heavier as you move along its length. And lambda could be some function of the distance from the pivot point r instead of just a constant. But we'll just stick to the nice case where it is constant. So what we want to do now is substitute this expression here into here. So we end up with i is equal to the integral. And our integral is now we've still got our r squared, but we're going to replace dr, sorry, we're going to replace dm with lambda dr. And our limits are from r equals 0 to r equals l. And that's good now. Our limits are in terms of this variable here, the dr. So that's what we wanted. Now, because lambda is just a constant, we can pull it out the front of our integral. So we have lambda times the integral from 0 to L of r squared dr. So we have lambda. Now, integrating r squared, we have r cubed on 3. And we're going from 0 to L. So this is equal to lambda times L cubed on 3. When we substitute in the 0, we just end up with 0. Okay, so that's a fairly nice expression, but we can make it a little bit nicer by looking up the top here. We said lambda was equal to m on l. So I'm going to replace this lambda now with m on l. So I've got m on l times l cubed on 3. So these l's cancel and I end up with ml squared on 3. So i equals ml squared on 3 is the moment of inertia of a rod which is pivoted about one end. So what we're going to look at now is how we can derive an expression for the moment of inertia of a disk. So we're going to start by considering a disk. The disk we're considering has a total mass capital M, a radius capital R and a height H. So we're going to be calculating the moment of inertia I, which we've seen before is equal to R squared dm. And so with our disk, we're going to break it up into little rings. So let's consider a little ring like this. And our little ring has a width here, dr and it's located a distance r from the pivot point, from the center of the disk about which the disk is spinning. So in order to substitute into this equation here to work out how this little ring contributes, we need to know the mass of the little ring. So dm is equal to mass 
a little ring and that will be equal to the density of the ring which we're assuming and that'll be equal to the density of the disc which we're assuming is uniform so assume uniform density times the volume of our little ring. So let's work out now what the density is and what the volume of this little ring is. So let's start with the density first. So the density for the disc is equal to the mass of the disc divided by the volume of the disc. Now we're told that the mass of the disc is capital M, so we've got that. And now we just need to work out the volume of the disc. So this disc has a surface area pi r squared because that's the surface area of a circle and then to get its volume we just times it by the height of the disc which is h. So the density of the disc is given by m over pi r squared h. Okay now what we need to do is calculate the volume of just this little ring here. So dv, let's imagine if we can taking this little disc uh, this little disc here and spreading it out so it is a rectangle when we spread it out it's got a width dr along here so that's this width here we've just uncurled it it's got a length here equal to the circumference of the circle so this length here is 2 pi r and it's got the same height as our disk, so it's got height h. So hopefully, from considering it this way, you can see that the volume is going to be given by 2 pi r h times dr. So now that we've got the volume and the density, we can work out dm. So dm is just multiplying these two things together. So we've got the density, which is capital M over pi r squared h, and then times the volume of our little ring. So 2 pi r h dr. Now some things will cancel out. We can cancel out our pi. We can cancel out our h. These r's are different r's. So this R here shows the distance of our little ring from the pivot point, the center of the disc. This capital R, that's the total radius of the disc. So this is equal to 2m r dr over r squared. So now that we've got dm in terms of r, we can substitute it into our equation up here for the moment of inertia of a disk. So we've got the total moment of inertia. Now we will want to sum up our little rings right from the center with radius zero to the outer radius, which is capital R. And then we've still got the R squared. This R squared is this R squared at the start times dm, which is 2m r dr over r squared. Now let's pull the constant terms out the front. So out the front we've got our 2m on r squared. This is capital R, so it's not a variable, it's the total radius. And then we're integrating from 0 to r, and we've got little r squared times little r, so that's r cubed dr. So doing this integration we've got the 2m on r squared, and then when we integrate r cubed, we end up with r to the 4 on 4. And this is from 0 to capital R. So now we can substitute this in. And we've got 2m on r squared times r to the 4 on 4. When we substitute in the 0, we just get 0. So when we subtract that off, it doesn't change it. Okay, so let's just simplify this a bit. We've got an r squared here, so we can cancel that with two of the r's here. So we've got an r squared here. We've got a two here, which will cancel with this four to leave two. So this is equal to m r squared on two, or a half m r squared. And we've now derived the moment of inertia of a disk. Now, another thing that's useful to know the moment of inertia of is the sphere. 
The derivation of this one is more complicated, so I'm not going to include it in this video. However, I have made a separate video covering it, which you've got the link to here. So in this video, we show that the moment of inertia of a sphere, when it's turned about the central axis, is given by 2 fifths mr squared. So in this problem, we're asked to find the... So in this problem, we're told that the angular speed of an object is given by the expression omega is equal to 2t plus 3 radians per second. And we're told that t equals 0, the object is at theta equals 0. And we're told that the object moves around a path with a radius of 3 meters. And in part A, we're asked to write an expression for the angular displacement of the object. Part B, write an expression for the angular acceleration of the object. Part C, write an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. Part D, write an expression for the radial acceleration of the object and E, write an expression for the magnitude of the acceleration of the object, and you do not need to simplify your expression. So in this one, we're told that omega is equal to 2t plus 3.0, so that's the angular speed, and at t equals 0, theta is equal to 0, and the object moves around a path with a radius of 3 meters. And in the first part, we're asked to write an expression for the angular displacement of the object. So what we're trying to find is an expression for theta. So we know how theta is related to omega. We know that omega is equal to d theta dt. So we can rearrange this and we have omega dt is equal to d theta. But we're told what omega is. It's equal to 2t plus 3. And then that's dt, which is equal to d theta. Okay, so to get this expression, we're going to want to integrate to get rid of our little derivatives, our d's here. So we're going from t equals 0 up to t equals t. And we know at time 0, theta is 0. We're told that. And at time t, theta is theta. So now we can integrate this. When we integrate 2t, we end up with t squared. And then we integrate 3, we end up with 3t. And this is at 0 and t. And on the right-hand side here, we've just got our theta from 0 to theta. So when we substitute in, we've got t squared plus 3t is equal to theta. So that is our expression for theta there. Now part B asks us to write an expression for the angular acceleration. So now we're asked to find, well, what's alpha? So alpha is equal to d omega dt. So we just have to differentiate 2t plus 3 with respect to time. And when we do that, when we differentiate 2t, we just end up with 2. And when we differentiate 3, that goes to 0 because it's just a constant. So our angular acceleration is equal to 2 radians per second per second. And then part C asks us to write an expression for the tangential acceleration of the object. OK, so we know that the tangential acceleration is related to the angular acceleration through the equation that the tangential acceleration is equal to alpha r. Now, we've just calculated alpha and we're given r, so this isn't too hard. So we've got 2 times 3, and that is equal to 6 meters per second per second. Now, in part d, we're asked for the radial acceleration. So the radial acceleration is the same thing as the centripetal acceleration. And we saw when we were looking at circular motion that that is equal to omega squared r. And up here, we've got our omega. So this is 2t plus 3. And then that's squared. That's omega squared times r, which is 3 meters. So let's expand our brackets because that's fun. So 2 squared, that's 4t squared plus 3 times 2, that's 6. And then there's two of them. So that is equal to 12. And then plus 3 squared, which is 9. And then times 3. And so this is equal to 12t squared plus 3 times 12. So that's plus 36t plus 3 times 9, which is 27. And so that is our radial acceleration. So that's directed back towards the center of the circle, whereas the tangential one is directed at a tangent to the circle. 
Okay, and then finally E asks us to write an expression for the magnitude of the acceleration. And we're told that we don't need to simplify this expression, which is nice of the question to say that. So the magnitude of our acceleration, we've got the radial one, which is going back towards the center, and we've got our tangential one, which is at right angles to it, a tangent. So to get the magnitude of the acceleration, we just need to use Pythagoras here. So we've got the radial squared plus the tangential squared, and we've calculated both these things. So the radial squared, that is equal to 12.0t squared plus 36.0t plus 27. And then we've got plus 6 squared. So 6 squared is 36. That's squared. Left off that squared. Okay, so we could go ahead and expand the brackets and everything, but it told us that we didn't have to bother simplifying it. So let's leave it in that format. So in this problem, we're told the bar starts from rest and rotates with constant angular acceleration about an axis located in the middle of the bar to reach an angular speed of omega in t seconds. The bar has a moment of inertia I for a bar of length L and mass M pivoted through its center. The moment of inertia is given by 1 12th ML. And we're asked to, in part one, write an expression for the angular acceleration of the bar. Okay, so I think the easiest way to do this is to recall our kinematic equation V is equal to U plus AT and use the rotational form of this. So the rotational form of this tells us that omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t and it's alpha that we've been asked to find and we've been told about omega in the question and we know that it starts from rest. So if it's starting from rest, omega naught must be equal to zero. So this thing's zero. So this tells us that, well, alpha is equal to omega over t. So that's an expression in terms of the variables given in the question, because in the question we're told omega and we are told t. Now in part two, it asks us the angle in radians through which it rotates in this time. So again, let's recall our kinematic equation, s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, and translate this into the rotational case where we've got theta is equal to omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared. But we know that omega naught is zero, we discussed that up there, so this one's zero. So we've got theta is equal to a half times alpha, which is omega over t, times t squared. So this is just equal to a half omega t. And then part three, we're asked what net force is acting on the bar over this time. Well, there is no net force. There's a net torque because it's starting to turn, but we're not told anything about a force acting upon it. So no net force. Don't need a net force to start it rotating. Just a net torque. So that tells us that net force is equal to zero. Okay, so in this problem, we're asked to derive an expression for the moment of inertia of a rod of length L and mass M pivoted through its center. So let's draw a little diagram. So we're pivoting through the center this way. So it'll be rotating that way. So we've got a length L on two here, and this one here is going to be minus L on two. And what we want to do is consider a little increment which is a distance x along and it's got width dx. And we'll be using our moment of inertia is equal to the integral of r squared dm. So we're going to need to know, well, what's the math, what's the mass of this little increment? So we can say, well, the linear density of the rod is equal to the mass of the rod divided by the length. And we know that the mass of this little bit here, dm, is equal to the linear density times dx, which is equal to m over l dx. Now let's consider, first of all, just half the rod. And then since the rod's perfectly symmetric, both halves are going to contribute equally to the total moment of inertia. So moment of inertia of half the rod. So we want to use i is equal to the integral. And here we're going from x equals 0 up to x is equal to l on 2. So from 0 to l on 2. And we're using 
x instead of r here. So x squared times dm, which is equal to m over l dx. So we can write this as m over l times the integral from 0 to l on 2 of x squared dx, which is equal to m over l times, when we integrate x squared, we get x cubed on 3 from 0 to l on 2. And so this is equal to m over l. Now we've got x cubed, so that's l cubed over 2 cubed, which is 8, and then times 1 on 3. And so one of these l's will cancel, and we end up with m l squared over 24. Now this was just for this half. This other half contributes equally. So total i is equal to 2 times i for half, whereas this is i for half. And so this is equal to double this. So when we double this, we end up with ml squared over 12 as the moment of inertia of a rod pivoted about its center. So you can see this is different to the equation when the rod was pivoted about one end. So the moment of inertia really does depend on where the mass distribution is pivoted.